Good evening, my students. This is your Mr. Grind himself, uh, teacher, Mr. Hamilton, social studies. We're going to have a short review on some of the key events that led to the Civil War and Louisiana's involvement. Shall we? All right. This is everything that you need to know for the next class. We're going to start off with sectionalism and secession. All right. Now, the essential question behind this, let me slide on over a little bit so you can get that entire question. There we go. All right. Essential question, how does slavery and sectionalism lead to secession? Once again, uh, sectionalism is the belief that your side or region of the country is better than another. And secession means to separate, to formally separate or remove from. Here we go. <clears throat> now, uh, these are some of the terms that we need to know. Emancipation, uh, states' rights, Missouri Compromise, uh, Wilmot Proviso, uh, Compromise of 1850, Popular Sovereignty, Fugitive Slave Act, Sectionalism, Secession, Confederate States of America. If we have not defined these terms already, then I need you to do that after watching this video. Here we go. <clears throat> Now, um, we have some disputes. All right? One main dispute uh, is the issue of states' rights all right? and the issue of slavery as a whole. <coughs> uh, between 1850, uh, 1820 and 1850, you have disputes uh, raised over the issue of slavery. Will it exist in the new territories? Will it not? All right? And then it starts infringing on the idea of states' rights, all right? which emphasizes the right, and I'm reading along, read along with me, the rights of individual states over the rights of the federal government. So many people believe that the state should have a choice in whether they should be free or slave, and it shouldn't be enforced on them by the federal government. Now, the Louisiana Purchase was an issue that really made this uh, go into more depth because now you have these new territories and this new vast land added to the country, but what do you do about the issue of slavery? Will these be free states or slave states? All right. Now, the Missouri Compromise was one effort to keep the country together because this didn't just start overnight. This was about 30 years in the 40, well, 40 years in the making leading to the Civil War. And this is one of the very first attempts at the country to compromise between the North and the South. So the Missouri Compromise of 1820 set um, a, board, a border between slave and free states. It's known as the 36-30 degree latitude line. All right. <clears throat> This line provided a permanent line of division through the tensions that still grew with the new state. All right, so Missouri is one of the very first states formed in the Louisiana Territory. All right, so this was also the Wilmot Proviso uh, was also an attempt to pro prohibit slavery or keep slavery from existing in the new territory. All right, um, so this was an area acquired during the Mexican-American War, 1846-1848. But it was never passed uh, by pro-slavery. It was just one a bill that was proposed. All right. Now, I'm going to go for, uh, ahead. Uh, one other key aspect we need to know is popular sovereignty. In the territories, popular sovereignty is the belief that they should have the right to vote on the issue of slavery. All right? It shouldn't be forced on by the federal government once again, and they feel like citizens in those new territories should be able to vote to decide if it will be free or slave. Now, the Fugitive Slave Act. <coughs> now, this act was an also another big part of the agreement. <coughs> That, uh, that allowed slave owners to recapture their slaves no matter where they ran. So even if they ran to a free state, uh, slave owners could hire someone to, to capture them and bring them back. And let me go back real quick. That was a part of, let me point that out, that was a part of the Compromise of 1850. Uh, now this is pretty much the last major attempt by the federal government uh, to ease the tensions between the north and the southern states. <clears throat> so they come up with the idea of popular sovereignty and compromise of 1850, believing that this will settle the issue that these new territories will be decided on free or slave by voting, which is the American way. And the Fugitive Slave Act is something that really was put into that compromise to help ease the tensions and, and um, I guess you could say to calm down the South, uh, because they felt like their slaves were running away and the North was protecting them. Now, if we look at this map, you see the Missouri Compromise, the 3630 Latitude Line is located right here. All right, Missouri um, is above that line. That's key because Missouri, this line, Missouri Compromise Line states that slavery isn't supposed to exist above it. All right, so no slavery is supposed to exist above that line. But Missouri is a slave state and it's above it. So Missouri gets special clemency or special permission to still be a slave state. Um, and it's admitted into the Union in 1821. But as a balance, so that the South is not, so that the North and the South don't feel like, okay, well, the South has more states now. What about us? So they admit Missouri as a slave state, and then they also admit Maine as a free state. All right, before this, Maine was a part of Massachusetts, 
and they separated and they formed their own state and they become free. So now in Congress, there's still a balance. You have a good balance of free and slave. Uh, neither is overpowering the other. All right, now Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin was a famous uh, abolitionist novel written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, she was a part of the reform movement of, of getting rid of uh, slavery, which is known as the abolitionist movement. Um, in her novel, she talked about the horrors of slavery <laughs> and how bad it was. Sorry, I got a little cold. cold. Grind with me. All right. Um, the horrors of slavery in her book till this day is one of the most uh, uh, highly selling books in, for its time. It sold over about 300,000 copies in just a matter of a few weeks. And after people read it, you start getting a lot of uh, uh, slavery abolitionist sympathizers that join the movement and push to end slavery. Now, um, in this, on this slide, you see some of the issues continue to talk about loyalty to party. Many people uh, are really not concerned with the issue of slavery. They're not a, a, a slave owner, don't own a plantation, never have, never will. But they start um, feeling like they have loyalty to a party. <coughs> so, so the issues of slavery um, eventually, as you see, overrode that. Now, a lot of people still feel loyal to their party. You have a few people like Andrew Johnson that we'll eventually learn about. Uh, that still stay loyal to their party, um, but you have Northerners and Southerners begin to separate themselves. All right? So they're in Congress. You have these congressmen that believe slavery is a, a, the right issue and the right way the country should be ran or the right way that states should be set up. And they start believing in a way of sectionalism, uh, believing that the South region is better, our economy is better because of the issue of slavery. They say, we have slaves. This is the way it should be. If it's not broke, then why try to fix it? Sectionalism. All right. Now, the election of 1860 with Abraham Lincoln um, and Andrew, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the election of 1860, I'm sorry, with Abraham Lincoln, <coughs> it, it brought up even more uh, reason for the South to go ahead and secede. Uh, they wanted to, they wanted a president in office um, that was going to back their views. They felt like Abraham Lincoln was an abolitionist president, and more than likely he would be, um, uh, his policies would probably push slavery out and the South is feeling like this is their way of life Their economy is for the most part solely based off of this that it would take away their way of life as they know it And not only hurt their, their financial institutions. All right, so <clears throat> When Lincoln won many southern states felt cheated uh, since he was not on their ballot All right, this actually began the secession of the states. They start to remove themselves. All right so Louisiana all right, wasn't one of the first to secede. <clears throat> they seceded only after uh, the actual war started. All right, so in April, uh, it was actually the year after the election of 1860, um, January 26, 1861, is when Louisiana seceded. All right, once again, secession is the withdrawal of a state from the Union, all right, from the entire country. All right, so they formed their own states. All right, so these six states in April, they joined six other states in the new Confederate States of America. So you're used to hearing the United States of America, but you have the Confederate States of America in 1861. That's the bill, they're coming back. Uh, we're gonna stop there. <clears throat> we're gonna stop there, um, leaving off with the Confederate States of America, knowing that that is the name of the Southern states that seceded or separated from the rest of the country. So this is your one and only, uh, Mr. Hamilton, Mr. Grind himself, I want you to grind, go over this information, make sure you know it, and be prepared for next class. Out. Signing out. Woo!